Welcome to the deep dive. Today, uh, we're going to be looking at the Hiraga 20W Class A amplifier. Oh, yeah. You shared some really interesting articles about this amp from the Class A amplifier site. Mm. And our mission today is to, you know, really break down the design, yeah, understand, it... you know, what makes this amp so special. Well, you know, it's interesting because the articles that you shared, they're not about like the first version of this amp. Uh, it's the third mm. iteration of the amp design. The third time's the charm, huh? Yeah. So it wasn't just like they, they designed it and then just, you know, forgot about it. Right. They kept working on it. Yeah. They addressed all the challenges. They incorporated feedback. Yeah. They even provided enough detail in the article so that other people could build the amplifier themselves. That's so cool. I mean, I, I love that kind of like open source collaborative spirit. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things that really jumped out at me was just how much emphasis they put on selecting the right transistors for this thing. I mean, they're the heart of any amplifier, but they kept talking about this thing, uh, A2D. Mm -hmm. What is that? So HBP, it's a measure of the transistor's amplification ability. Okay. So you can kind of think of it as like the strength of the transistor. Uh -huh. The higher the AP, the stronger the transistor is. Gotcha. And it can amplify the signal more. That makes sense. But the challenge with this design yeah. is that even small variations in HEB between transistors okay. could really throw off the balance of the whole circuit. Oh, wow. So did they like have to go out and find perfectly matched transistors or something? So initially in their prototype, they actually just kind of fine-tuned okay. the values of the resistors yeah. to compensate for the specific transistors they were using. Right. But... You know, that wouldn't be practical for anyone else who wants to build this. I guess not. Because you'd have to find the exact same transistors with the exact same HE values. Right. So what they did in this final version is they modified the design okay. to accommodate a wider range of HE values. Well, that's clever. Yeah. So that it was more robust. You know, you could use. It makes it more accessible, right? Exactly. Right. But they still mention this term pair matching. Yeah. What's that all about? So even with this modification, yeah. it's still really important to use transistors with similar HFA values okay. for optimal performance. Gotcha. You know, think of it like you're baking a cake or something. Yeah. If you don't measure the ingredients precisely, right. the cake might not turn out as good. That makes total sense. So it's the same thing here. I'm starting to realize that, you know, component selection is not just a matter of grabbing any old part out of the bin. Right. Like, this is really crucial. Yeah, absolutely. Every component plays a role in the final sound. And speaking of crucial components, we got to talk about the power supply, right? Yes. <laughs> I mean, the articles went really deep into, like, you know, the challenge of finding that sweet spot between power output and supply voltage mm -hmm. and making sure the thing doesn't get too hot. You know? Yeah. Right. They kept calling it this Goldilocks voltage. Yeah. Which I, I can relate to. I mean, I've I've built an amp before. Yeah. And I completely fried a component. Oh, no. It was not a good day. So thermal runaway is definitely something to avoid. Yes. You don't want things getting too hot and damaging the components. Definitely not. So, yeah, finding that just right voltage is crucial. What was the magic number for the Haraga? So for this amp, they settled on a supply voltage of 19 to 21 volts. Okay. Which allowed them to hit that target output power of 20 watts, mm -hmm. but also stay within those safe operating temperatures. It's a real balancing act, huh? It is. It is. There's a lot of trade-offs right. that engineers have to consider. Speaking of trade-offs, yeah. what other modifications did they make in this final version of the amp? So two significant modifications come to mind. Okay. The first was they adjusted the resistor values in the first two amplification stages. Right. And that was to ensure symmetrical saturation. Symmetrical saturation. Can you break that down for me a little? Yeah. So you can imagine an audio signal as like a wave, right? Okay. And when the amplifiers push too hard, the peaks of that wave get clipped or kind of flattened. Huh. And symmetrical saturation basically ensures that clipping happens evenly. Oh. On both the positive and negative peaks. Right. And that results in a smoother, less harsh sounding distortion. Interesting. So it's not just about avoiding distortion entirely. It's about shaping it. Exactly. Managing it in a way that actually sounds good. That's fascinating. I never thought about it like that. Yeah. What was the second big change they made? So the second modification was they fine-tuned the voltage at the base of the output transistors. Yep. And this adjustment basically helps to maintain the optimal current flow okay. through those transistors. Gotcha. So too much current, things get fried, not enough current, and you don't get the power that you need. So it's all about finding that balance. Exactly. 
Yeah, every detail matters. And there's one more detail that I, I really want to get into. Yeah. And that's negative feedback. Oh, yeah. Are you ready to dive into that? Absolutely. Negative feedback, huh? Yeah. It sounds a little counterintuitive, right? It does. You're feeding part of the output signal back into the input, but flipped around. Exactly. Backwards. Yeah. It's like a self-correcting system, okay. almost like a tightrope walker, you know, that yeah. you use a balance pole right. to stay upright. Yeah. And that's kind of what negative feedback is doing. I see. It's helping the amp to kind of stay stable. Yeah. Stay accurate. Exactly. But wouldn't that create some kind of feedback loop? Mm-hmm. Like that awful screeching sound you get with a microphone yeah. too close to a speaker? That's a great question. And that's why the negative part of negative feedback is really important. Yeah. Because that reversed polarity okay. actually works against the original signal. Right. So it stops that runaway feedback loop. So it's more like a balancing act then. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this stuff is way more complicated than I realized. It can be, yeah. So what are the main benefits of using negative feedback in this design? So one of the key benefits is that it reduces distortion. Okay. You know, we were talking earlier about those transistor nonlinearities. Right, those pesky transistors. Yeah, negative feedback really helps to smooth those out, oh. leading to a much cleaner, more accurate reproduction. Okay, so it's kind of like having a built-in quality control system yeah. that's catching any imperfections before they get to the speakers. Exactly. But I've heard some audiophiles say that using too much negative feedback can make an amp sound kind of, I don't know, sterile, mm -hmm. lifeless. That's a common debate in the audiophile world. Yeah. Some people think that too much negative feedback can rob the music of some of its like natural warmth right. and dynamics. That's like over-processing a photo. Exactly. You get rid of all the grain, but it just doesn't have the same character. Yeah, you lose something. So did the designers of this amplifier have any thoughts on this? They actually address this directly in the article. And while they're clearly big proponents of objective measurements, uh -huh. they also acknowledge the importance of the subjective listening experience. Right. So you got to find that balance. Exactly. It's about finding the right amount of negative feedback. Yeah. That gives you technical accuracy, mm -hmm. but also preserve the musical enjoyment. So they didn't just want an amp that measured well on paper. Really? They wanted one that sounded good. Exactly. All right, I'm sold on negative feedback. Good. What about the power supply? Yes. They go into a lot of detail about, you know, making sure the power supply is super clean. Absolutely. Starting with this thing called star grounding. Mm -hmm. Why did they go to all this trouble? Well, you know, think about it like plumbing. Huh? You got water flowing through multiple paths. You might end up with leaks. Yeah. Uneven pressure. Right. Same thing in an electrical circuit. Okay. If you have multiple ground paths. Yeah. You can get something called a ground loop. And ground loops are bad. Ground loops are bad. What? They introduce noise. <gasps> you get that annoying hum or buzz. Oh, yeah. I've heard that before. <laughs> exactly. So star grounding prevents that. Yeah. So by connecting all the ground wires to a single point, right. you're basically creating this like clean and organized path. It's like making sure all the electrical waste goes down the same drain. Yeah, exactly. And they were also really specific about the type of wire to use. Uh -huh. They use this Litz wire, right? Yeah. What's so special about Litz wire? So Litz wire, it's made up of multiple strands of insulated wire oh, woven uh, together. Yeah. And what that does is it helps to minimize something called the skin effect. Skin effect? Mm. I'm picturing electrical signals sunbathing on the wire. Well, not quite that dramatic. Okay. But basically at higher frequencies. Yeah. The signals tend to travel more along the surface of the conductor. Interesting. And that increases resistance, which impacts signal quality. Ah, so let's wire kind of smooths that out, yeah. gives those high frequencies a clear path. Yeah, it's like a dedicated lane on the electrical highway. I love it. And then there are the capacitors. Yeah. They used some pretty fancy capacitors in this power supply. They did. Why? Well, so capacitors are crucial for smoothing out the voltage. Right. But even high-quality capacitors can have some limitations, especially at those high frequencies. Okay. Some types, like electrolytic capacitors, yeah. they can start acting like inductors at high frequencies. Oh, no! Which we don't want. We don't want inductors crashing the party. Exactly. So what did they do? So to address that, yeah. they added these smaller, higher-quality capacitors in parallel. Right. with the bigger ones. Right. And what that does is it helps bypass those high frequencies. Ah, so it keeps the signal path clean. Exactly. So it's all about using the right components mm -hmm. and understanding their strengths and weaknesses. Yes. It's kind of like assembling a team of superheroes, right? Yeah, I like that analogy. Each one has their own special power. I'm Speaking of superheroes, 
Let's talk about the transformer. Oh, yeah. The heart of the power supply. Yeah. They use this double C core transformer. That's right. Which sounds pretty hardcore. It is a beast. Why did they go with that type? So the shape of the core. Okay. Which is made of laminated steel sheets. Right. It helps to reduce electromagnetic radiation. Oh, wow. So you can think of it kind of like a shield ah. that's preventing the transformer from leaking electromagnetic energy. So it's a quieter transformer. A quieter, more efficient transformer. Nice. But there are some downsides. Oh. They can be a little bit fragile. Really? Yeah. Those laminated sheets. Yeah. If they get knocked out of alignment, it can impact the performance. So it's kind of like a high performance engine, right? Yes. You got to treat it with care. Exactly. I'm getting a sense for just how much detail went into this design. It's impressive. And there's one more thing I wanted to ask you about. Yeah. Speaker loads. They found something interesting about how this amp behaves mm -hmm. with different speaker loads. That's right. What's a speaker load? So a speaker load basically refers to the impedance of the speaker. Okay. Which is a measure of how much resistance it offers. Right. To the flow of current. So like if you have a 4-ohm speaker, yeah. you get more power out of the amp than an 8-ohm speaker. Generally, yes. But this amplifier, yeah. it has a more consistent power output across a wider range of speaker impedances. Really? Yeah. So it's not as picky. That's amazing. Yeah, you get that high quality sound regardless of the speaker's impedance. And a testament to the design. It is. And that actually brings us to another key element mm -hmm. we haven't talked about yet. Yeah. The output stage. Yes. The output stage configuration. That's right. I'm intrigued. Let's hear about it. Right. The output stage. Yes. This is where the amplified signal actually gets sent to the speakers. Exactly. It's the last stage in the signal path. And in many ways, the most critical, okay. the designers of this amp, they chose a really unique configuration for the output stage. Oh. It's called a quasi-complementary design. Quasi-complementary. Yeah. Sounds a little complicated. It is a bit more complex yeah. than a traditional complementary output stage. All right, break it down for me. Okay, so a complementary output stage, yeah. it typically uses both NPN and PNP transistors right. to handle the positive and negative halves of the signal. Mm -hmm. But the problem is those transistors. Yeah. They can have slightly different characteristics. Okay. And that can lead to some distortion. So the quasi complementary design yeah. gets around that. Exactly. How? So it uses only NPN transistors, okay. which tend to have better linearity and matching characteristics. So it results in less distortion. Less distortion, a cleaner sound, more accurate reproduction of the music. Wow. It's amazing how these subtle design choices. Yeah can have such a big impact. Absolutely, it all adds up. Yeah. It makes me wonder if that's what really sets this amplifier apart from other more generic designs. I think you're right. It's this attention to detail. Yeah. You know, it's like the difference between a mass-produced piece of furniture and a handcrafted heirloom. Oh, I like that. You know, both might serve the same function. Right. But that craftsmanship, that attention to detail, yeah. is what makes it special. It's something you cherish. Exactly. I mean, this whole deep dive has given me such an appreciation yeah. of the level of craftsmanship that goes into making a truly great amplifier. Yeah, and it's easy to forget about that. Yeah. You know, all the technology that goes into bringing music to our ears. It really is remarkable. It is. Well, this has been an incredible journey. It has. Into the world of high fidelity audio. Mm -hmm. We've uncovered the secrets of the Hiraga 20W Class A amplifier. Yeah. The meticulous component selection, the ingenious circuit design. Mm -hmm. We've talked about negative feedback, clean power supplies, and how true audio excellence is all about that balance of technical perfection yeah. and musicality. It's been a pleasure sharing this deep dive with you. And to our listeners, we hope you've enjoyed this exploration yeah. of a true audio icon. Definitely. Until next time, keep diving deep.